This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Hi, uh, welcome to Senate House, the Institute of Modern Languages Research. You're aware that I might be the only person in this room that you don't know. My name is uh, Natalia Brona and I'm the postdoc here in Frankenstein Studies. I'm going to be live tweeting uh, from the uh, conference, and please, if you are on Twitter, please feel free to join in the debate. So the official uh, hashtag is what is ML? And I found out you can either put the question mark or not the question mark, it doesn't matter. And I've researched. <laughs> so, <laughs> so and, uh, and the password. Oh, and the password for the, the wireless uh, is, is up there. The Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi. Um, yeah. So, without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, Captain Daly, director of the IMLR. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Natalia. One of the things we do the IMLR is give opportunities to write young things like Natalia. We can do all this Twitter stuff. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, so the idea of this, um, this workshop, and thank you very much for coming, it's oversubscribed, although obviously a few people haven't been up. The idea of this workshop came from uh, Charles Forsnick, who you no doubt know, who's the um, leader of the Translating Cultures um, uh, theme in the HRC, and also from Charles um, Burnett, who's got... Uh, one of the three big translating culture AHRC grants. So we thought that we just think about a definition, try and get the, what I would like as the director of the Institute of Modern Languages Research is to know what it is we're meant to be doing. <laughs> so um, I would like a nice brief definition, one sentence definition of what is modern languages research. And I think it's important that we have this, not just uh, for us, obviously, but for um, our funders and the government, and for our um, public, and for the other disciplines, because the whole question of how you can be interdisciplinary um, is important if you don't have a disciplinary basis. Um, some of these questions will come up during the day, I'm sure. But I, um, I've already talked a little bit about this in the uh, plenary that I was giving it in the Association of History this, but it's something that's really, it's really taxing me at the moment to think what it is we're meant to be doing. Where are the limits of modern languages research? So if we go back to this re <coughs> report that you'll all uh, know by now, I'm sure the Modern Foreign Language Commission in Higher Education in England 2009, uh, this was what Michael Wilson said we needed to do develop a clear and compelling identity for modern foreign languages and present a convincing case to the universities for modern languages and to develop research to inspire uh, next generations and to show how modern languages research, which is, he says, inherently methodologically innovative and interdisciplinary, enriches the art of humanity. So nobody would debate that modern languages research is interdisciplinary. I think that's taken for granted. It's where its foundations are, I suppose, what I'm asking. And I found this article that you can just get easily on the, um, on, on the web, uh, just put it in Google, what are academic disciplines. I found this very interesting. It was uh, uh, written in 2009 for the ESRC. And Armin Krishna gives some ideas of what a discipline is or what it has. Uh, and then he goes on to discuss what interdisciplinary uh, research is. So a discipline has an object of research which it may share with other disciplines. It has a body of accumulated specialist knowledge. It has certain theories and concepts which are specific to it. It has terminologies and technical language which are specific to it. Which some would say were jargon and some would say was terminologies and technical language. And it's got research methods which is specific to it. Now all of those things should be part of a discipline. The one big exception is English, which is a very strong discipline, but doesn't necessarily have any of this for itself. It shares it with other disciplines, right? So what is the most important thing, I think, is the last point, which is there has to be recognition of that discipline at the level of the institution. So a university has to recognise that that discipline exists 
and that that discipline can reproduce itself from one generation to another. And another thing he said, which I've not put there, was that if you have studies at the end of your discipline, it's somehow inferior to not having it. So <laughs> film studies, cultural studies, Hispanic studies, is inferior to history, geography, archaeology, philology. So some definitions. If you, if you look for a definition for historical research, you'll find one. It is a systematic examination of past events to give an account of what happened in the past. One sentence. And the historical research methods are these. An identification of research problems, hypothesis, the collation of evaluation of data, synthesis of information, confirmation of hypothesis, interpretation of conclusions. Very neat. Geography researches seeks to understand the spatial aspects of the Earth and its human and natural complexities. So, have we got any definitions for modern language research anywhere? Well, the Higher Education Statistics Agency defines language studies as this. The study of X language, its structure, history, grammar and use, may include the study of X culture and literature using the techniques of literary analysis and interpretation. That is relevant to an extent, is it not? But I don't know to what extent we do in this country a lot of structure, history, grammar of language, and whether that falls within modern languages even. Where's the, where's the, the boundary with applied linguistics? The HRC definition of language-led research, which Dylan will um, correct me on if it's wrong, is where a modern language focus determines the content of the research or the methodologies, theories, or concepts by which the approach will be underpinned. So I'm interpreting that as research rooted in language and intercultural issues and expertise, interdisciplinary research grounded in language expertise. And for the HRC, as far as I know, a modern language is any human language in use today, anywhere in the world. So it could be TIV, or it could be Swahili could be any language, need not be French, Spanish, Portuguese, the Western European languages. So that's the end of my presentation. Was that 10 minutes? Oh, that's less than 10 minutes. Oh, good, good. <laughs> because Natalia is going to put, um, is going to tell us when <laughs> the end of our 10 minutes, because that's what the, uh, that's the method they use in the Westminster Forum. I don't know if you've ever one of those. People give 10 minute presentations and then they, they have to stop. So I'd ask you all to keep to time. Um, so I'll hand over now to uh, Charles. Charles, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to get your... Right. Um, what I've got to say is it's really going to resonate with a number of Catherine's points. Um, I'm, I'm interested in public perception, public understanding of modern languages. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the translating cultures theme and some of the, the conclusions that have emerged from that that I think are important for us in the modern languages community as the discipline evolves, and which goes back to, to Catherine's point there about institutionalization embedding, um, but also that idea of a discipline um, being passed on from one generation of scholars and students to another. And then there's a final slide which is going to pick up on something that I think will uh, recur today, and that's um, disciplinarity and interdisciplinarity, and the inherent um, interdisciplinarity of modern languages and what that means and how that, that should manifest itself perhaps in more active ways than present. But I want to start with a couple of comments on public understanding of languages. Um, one thing that's struck me in the media when languages are reported <laughs> is that the approach is often one of divide and rule. There's, there's, there's no sense of a collectivity of languages being studied. Um, it's individual languages um, being um, almost uh, taken as vehicles for fragmented understanding of, of culture. This is um, David Cameron. Um, 18 months ago in um, China, and it's the headlines that interest me, that sort of ditch French and learn Mandarin. Again, that, that idea that we've got this sort of competitive hierarchy of languages whose instrumentalization um, means that we have to um, 
promote some and relegate others. And it's interesting that some of you might have seen this in, in the press uh, at the weekend. This is in the Independent. Um, British Council uh, report about the 10 most important strategic languages for um, the UK. Again, similar approach, instrumentalization and understanding of languages in, in a purely um, commercial and strategic sense. But also that, that this idea that we have to look at languages individually. Um, this one again, the, you'll see the recurrent theme here. Forget French and Mandarin. <laughs> Arabic is a language to learn. The, the, if you haven't seen the report, but the, um, the top three were um, Spanish, Arabic, and French, um, which is interesting. Now, I haven't chosen those because of the uh, further kicking that French gets on every occasion. Since <laughs> uh, French is, is studied by a claret swilling, um, uh, a claret swilling elite. Um, th th that's not the reason I've chosen that. It, it, it's precisely for what I think those headlines, and there are a number of other um, cases that, that follow that model, tell us about public understanding of language or public misunderstanding of language. Um, and the way in which we're perhaps as a community um, not being wholly successful in uh, communicating what we try to do, um, not just in our teaching, but also crucially for today's purposes um, in our research. Now, as I suggested, and those couple of stories there exemplify this, I think, um, on the one hand, in public perception of language, there's this reduction of languages to um, the instrumental. And often that's linked into the sense that there's not an intellectual project, there's not an interdisciplinarity um, underpinning um, the acquisition of languages, particularly at a higher level. And I, as you see, I think that, that, that ties into this sense that modern languages is not, and this goes back to, to, to Catherine's demonstration, um, uh, presentation, uh, modern languages are not recognised outside the academy, and I doubt often <coughs> within the academy, um, as an arts humanities disciplinary field um, which is comparable to English to geography or to um, history. Added to that is this sense of what I call sort of divide and rule logic. Um, that we can't study one language whilst recognizing the importance of another. And um, increasingly, I think, we need to challenge headlines or political gestures like the ones that I've just outlined. Um, and we need, and this comes back to Michael Wharton's report um, six years ago, um, we need to think about this unity of modern languages as a disciplinary field, um, which is a vehicle for advocacy for linguistic um, plurality. Because when we talk about the threats of monolingualization, often that seems to imply an all-encroaching anglosphere um, and, and, and a sense that um, languages, are, and other languages, <coughs> particularly minority languages, are sort of the eclipse, and there's this entropic spread of um, a global English. What interests me when we talk about monolingualization is not that process, which clearly um, is um, occurring, but in more subtle ways than was perhaps understood 10 or 15 years ago. It's also this idea of monolingualization um, which splits up the world into different areas and precisely denies what I think should interest us and drive us as modern language, uh, modern language researchers. That is the way in which languages depend on interaction and relationality. In terms of the transiting cultures theme, um, that's one aspect I'm, I'm going to talk about. Um, everyday multilingualism and the contact um, between languages. So, picking up what Catherine said, I think the, um, the priority for us is to continue to think about modern languages as a disciplinary unit which can, can, which can encompass um, various forms of linguistic diversity. And the HRC have this rather permissive um, definition of modern languages. It's one that I welcome and it's one I would amplify. I'm going beyond the verbal as well. I think British Sign Language and other sign languages are clearly a, a part of the HRC understanding of, of modern languages. And that leads very importantly to what I think is a, a key political issue for us at the moment. And that's the expansion of modern languages um, within a available resource and where possibly beyond European languages, and which takes us into that area of what's the relationship between modern languages and language-based area studies, which is something we might talk about later. So the HRC theme, I think a number of you will, will be familiar with it, but just a, a, a couple of comments on that. It's been running now for about five years. It's very much responding to, um, from an arts and humanities perspective, to, to the perception of the contemporary world being one characterized by um, increasing mobility, increasing communication across cultures, across languages. Central to it, not surprisingly, is the notion of translation, but uh, translation understood interlinguistically, interlinguistically, and also in relation to the circulation and transformation of a whole series of other phenomena. The other thing to say about the theme is that um, there are a number of sub-themes, I suppose, um, around 
diplomacy, multiculturalism, um, politics of tolerance and intolerance, identities and migration. And central to the work we've been trying to do is this promotion of um, activity across languages, but also across disciplines um, and across sectors, so moving beyond the academy. Just to give you a flavour of um, what we've done so far, um, we've, we've had about 90 awards made, um, from smallish research development awards, um, three, four years ago, to three very large grants, which were made um, 18 months or so ago, um, and Charles Burnett will be talking about those at the moment. So we've got a large constellation of awards. It's a very exciting theme at the moment. When you add um, a number of other awards made through responsive mode, not directly into the theme, but which resonate with very clearly, we've got over 100 projects, a number in translation, uh, translation studies in modern languages, but across a wide range of humanities disciplines. Just, what I wanted to tease out with some of the conclusions, we're already drawing to the midpoint in the theme that might be of relevance to um, our discussions as to what um, modern languages is as a research <coughs> There's not a single central <coughs> sentence gathering, but we can distill it into, into a Proustian one. Um, they, 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 the first idea that's come up very clearly from a lot of our projects, and I, I think it's important one for us in modern languages, is we need to challenge talk of language barriers. Language barriers are humanly constructed, um, and part of being human is the constant negotiation of language barriers through translation, through um, the acquisition of other languages, um, through the development of, 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 of technologies. And um, I think underpinning that idea is that the sense of multilingualism, um, particularly in the Anglophone world, needs to be seen as a resource and not as a problem, but actually monolingualism um, is the stumbling block. Now, um, I think that's a common message for those of us in modern languages. It's not necessarily one we're communicating. Um, properly. I think there's an urgency to communicate because of this idea that the 21st century um, is very much to be seen as a, a post-monolingual moment, um, one which is characterised by these sort of phenomena here, everyday multilingualism, the idea of uh, linguistic repertoires, code switching between languages in a limited number of contexts, and also that sense that we live in um, contact zones, translation zones, where languages are constantly coming up against each other and there is friction um, between them. That said, it's clearly important for modern languages to avoid any presentism. Um, everything I've talked about there, although it might be particularly acute in the early 21st century, can be historicised, and that historicisation is important. Similarly, I think we need to avoid what I'm currently called chronic extroversion. So on the one hand, we can't say that our field is about now. Um, similarly, it's not about there. There's often been a sense in modern languages that it's about the foreign, and that's why modern foreign languages was used for a while. It's a term I really don't like at all. Because I think modern language is increasingly is about the domestic um, as, as much as it is about um, the, the foreign. And that, that domestic dimension comes through when we start thinking much more self-reflexively um, about our work. It also allows us to, um, as modern linguists, to think about a number of key areas of concern where language and translation are very important. And that takes us back to that issue of continuing to nurture public understanding of what we do. So. What's essential for me, going back to Catherine's presentation, is that idea which underpins today's workshop of a clear disciplinarity. And if there is a single sentence, I keep going back to Mary Louise Pratt's Silver Lecture in 2001, where she says modern language is about knowing languages and knowing the world through languages. And my fear is that begs more questions than it answers. But it's still a very useful, pithy sentence, but you know, which languages, which world, and, um, and uh, the, the through, what, what's the actual mechanism? Um, now, I think that's a useful definition, um, but, and I think it leads on to two things. One is, it behoves us as modern, lingu uh, as modern linguists to challenge a whole range of other disciplinary fields which might be seen as linguistically mute or alinguistic, where language is not being considered possibly even as a social category, as a variable, which is absolutely essential um, in, in all research sort of projects. It's, it's key to everything we do. Sometimes, perhaps, we don't recognize it as key. Um, and that takes us into that idea we talked about this afternoon of what's the relationship between translation and modern languages. There's been a traditional antagonism um, in, in some quarters between those, but I should, I'll, I'll, I'll finish here. Two, two ideas are that I think translation um, is being seen more um, and more as something that transcends transmission and circulation of ideas. It's actually something which is central to the construction of knowledge, to creativity, um, and also. Um, we mustn't forget, this is again where modern language is so important, no matter how much we might talk about the translatable, the untranslatable remains an absolutely essential um, uh, area of study.
bubble like essence, dictionary level translatables um, reflects that. So, fun slide, and I will, and I will stop here. And I, 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 this is really just some summarizing what I've said. I, once we can understand that clear disciplinary core, I think it allows us to reflect much more clearly on our interdisciplinary potential. Um, and uh, that's to do with this assertion of a clear identity, challenging fields which are linguistically mute. Crucially, when we're engaging in this disciplinary working, ensuring that that's on equal terms. We're not simply embedded and subjugated and seen as offering some sort of glorified language section, um, but we're actually driving um, research agendas. That leads into questions around um, internationalization of research and again to this key area of um, integrating language to issues of public concern. Thank you for your indulgence. Things within modern languages move quickly until fairly recently. It would have made perfect sense to talk about separate disciplines of French, German, Hispanic, or Italian studies. But as has been said, the world around us has changed. To begin with, we work almost without exception within schools of modern languages, and these are not simply loose confederations, but tightly organized structures. The REF, of course, now considers modern languages as a totality. Within our own institutions, we define and defend ourselves as modern languages. We will benefit from the work that has been accomplished by the British Academy, the UCML, and of course, the Institute of Modern Languages Research. In a wider context, we all work within a new fee regime where there is greater pressure than ever before to explain the employability of our graduates. We engage with the impact agenda, demonstrating the potential of our work to change human practice. We face a decline in the national provision of modern languages in higher education and a reality where fewer students than we would wish choose to study our subject. We all regularly face circumstances in which we have to define what it is that we do and why it is important. We also, of course, face the reality of globalisation, an age that is increasingly defined as post-national and mobile. And our research and teaching has to be adequate to this reality. If one works in a European culture, and I speak as an Italianist, then one has more and more to explain its relevance in global terms. The question then is how all these issues influence how we think about research in modern languages. Every one would nowadays, I think, uh, would agree that it, um, that the purpose of research is not only to suggest new objects of study, but new ways of study. It is, in other words, to change the way in which we do things and to develop the means through which we attain knowledge. Every piece of research intends, in some way, to extend the boundaries of disciplinary inquiry. But this is where modern languages faces something of a dilemma. On one side, one might argue that within modern languages a distinct set of methodological operations are conducted that comprise, broadly speaking, literary and cultural study, linguistics, all say, history. And one might argue that it isn't really appropriate to speak of modern languages as a discipline, and that the very diversity of approach that one finds within any school of modern languages leads to a vibrant field of study. On the other side, however, one might argue that such a de definition raises some problems in that modern languages do constitute a discipline and that they represent a community of researchers and students, that they are identified as such by universities, by their universities, and by a series of initiatives carried out by research councils and by HEFKI, on whose funding we depend. Moreover, one might argue that as a result of institutional configurations, what were once very distinct disciplinary approaches are brought more and more into a productive dialogue with one another. A dialogue that inevitably throws into questions previous definitions. However you articulate a sense of disciplinarity, there is no doubt that modern languages do need to be clear about their objects of study and the methodological principles on which that study is based. Modern languages research and study have become inherently interdisciplinary, and yet, when interdisciplinary is prized, 
the range of objects and methods of inquiry developed in modern languages has been construed in terms of ambiguity rather than strength. Given the context of the times, we do need to make robust definitions of what we stand for. As part of a group of researchers engaged in a project with a rather grandiose title of transnationalizing modern languages, I would clearly advocate that we do need to think about how the elements, all the elements of what we do, come together into a powerful synthesis. Indeed, the project is attempting to do two things. At one level, it's examining the forms of mobility that have defined the development of modern Italian culture and its interactions with other cultures across the globe. It is attempting to do this by concentrating on a series of exemplary cases representative of the geographic, historical and linguistic map of Italian mobility. It looks at the Italian communities established in the UK, the US, Australia, South America, Africa and at the migrant communities of contemporary Italy from where their time I'll show the research map of the project. Focusing on the cultural associations that each community has formed, the project examines the wealth of publications and materials that are associated with these organisations. That is, journals, literature, life stories, photographs, collections of memorability, memorabilia, and other forms of representation. It thus investigates the processes of translation that are evident at every level of the communities in question, and that characterise all the textual, strength, visual material associated with them. It looks at how the web of concepts, traditions and modes of perception that constitute one culture are transposed into the terms of other sign systems, changing the material world that surrounds us, but also the internal world of the individual, his or her subjective experience. But there is a second aim to the project, boldly declared in its title. From the insights that it develops into transnational Italian cultures, it aims to participate in the reframing of modern languages as a whole. And here the project is bringing together researchers from across the discipline, from the advisory board and from you know, various countries <coughs> that have developed over the course of the project. Modern languages is, as we know, generally seen as an area of the specialists working in discrete fields associated <coughs> with nation states but it needs, we argue, to be articulated as an expert mode of inquiry whose founding research question is that of how languages and cultures operate and interact across diverse axes of connections, which may reflect <coughs> according to historical, geographic or cultural conditions. That question we maintain needs to take its place as a foundational one and not only for modern languages. Thus, the project aims to provide a model that allows modern languages to be construed and practiced not as the inquiry into separate national traditions, but as the study of cultures and their interactions. It focuses on the centrality of language and culture as situated sets of practices, whose performance is crucial to interactions in all areas of social life, from individual experience to the building of local, as well as virtual communities. As I say, the aim of the project is to bring researchers from all languages together, and we aim to do this not only with the final conference in December 2016, which will be looking at the transnational through a range of disciplinary frames. The project is also attempting to do this by producing a series of texts, framework texts, which are intended to be used at all levels of higher education, texts which aim to refine the key concepts and methodologies that constitute the fields of understanding of modern languages, that address the division between the study of language and culture, which is pervasive, but which is detrimental, both within the academic context and within public perception. Texts that work from the premise that cross-cultural and multilingual encounters shape the human experience of being in and knowing the world. Thus, the aim of the series that Liverpool University Press will be publishing is to play an active role in reframing modern languages. Essays within the anchoring text and in accompanying volumes 
will address how research and study can be carried out in a transnational context, <coughs> and each contribution will explore the methodological basis of its inquiry. The series as a whole aims to enhance the robustness of the disciplinary identity of modern languages. It will enable students with modern languages to develop the tools to address the complex, multilingual and multicultural fabric of past and contemporary life. I'll stop there. I think we're back to us. When I started off, it was a real aspiration to publish in German, so my German colleagues would read it. 
And now, all my German colleagues are desperately trying to publish in English. So there's been a real shift there. Um, I'm sad about it, but I think it gives us an opportunity because it makes it much easier to share our ideas as a discipline. So I, I kind of state that as a fact in the way that all academic work was done in Latin a few centuries ago. I feel that that is the way, uh, certainly in the Germanic languages. I know Fonkofuni seems to be more successful in holding on to it. <coughs> Um, something else that I think will happen to modern languages research is that it will be uh, quite driven by the end users and hopefully in a good way. And by the end users, I'm largely thinking of our undergraduate students who come in. And they very much want something that's come up a few times, which is more focus on applied language studies. They're very interested in translation, linguistic analysis. Uh, and I think that is something where some language departments or some language sections and some languages are relatively weak. Now, I'm not, I am a linguist, I'm sorry, but I also have a PhD in medieval literature. So I do believe in literature and even the most distant, remote, uh, non-impact friendly literature that you can imagine. So it's not that I'm trying to get rid of anything, but I do think we need a strong linguistics and applied language presence in all our departments partly because it is a massive field across language studies internationally and it is very led by English language studies because that is the first language that everybody else is doing as their first foreign language. So it's very dominated and I can see that in my own field of historical sociolinguistics for example which is a really exciting field but it always seems to be led by English specialists in English from other countries sometimes. So I think we're really missing out on an opportunity of representing ourselves as specialists of, it used to be the abbreviation languages other than French, but languages other than English, uh, which is also different. I don't mean it in that sense as um, English is a foreign language, not that type of thing. Um, uh, so I think that's something that is important and that's something we need to think about strategically. How are we going to staff our departments in future? Um, and I think there is a case to be made for making sure linguistics and applied language studies are very strongly represented. Not at the expense of everything else, but they must be there. Um, another question uh, that obviously poses itself that we've thought about is which languages are modern languages? Um, and interestingly, I saw the HRC definition says any language is a modern language, which to me begs the question, why do we even need the word modern? Um, coming from an Australian context originally, I still find it a slightly odd phrase. And what linguists as a phrase, I think, is not understood by the public. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like we do something different to what we do. So personally, I don't even like the phrase, but that's irrelevant. Um, what uh, I do want to say is that back in 1900, modern languages was French, maybe German. Then by kind of the 1930s or so, it was French and German, maybe Spanish. Uh, we've expanded such that it's French, German, Italian, and Russian, definitely. Probably roughly in that order, if I said it. Mm. French, and it's now French, Spanish, German, then Italian, and Russian. Uh, but increasingly, other languages are coming through, and we've heard about Mandarin, whether we, this contest within the languages. Um, I think we should just be confident about the fact that we are actually growing, we're becoming wider. This has happened throughout the century since the discipline has had any sense of its identity, and we shouldn't be frightened of that. And I think we just need to bear in mind that languages like Mandarin Chinese are going to come through. <coughs> um, I read recently, it was some statistics from 2007, but at the GCSE, French and Mandarin was the sixth most popular combination of languages. So we are having, it was a long way behind the top three, may I say, which are French and Spanish, French and German, something, whatever the next most obvious one would be. Um, but it's still in the top six. Uh, and that we have more and more pupils coming through, or entrants coming through, for whom Chinese is a language like all the other uh, languages, and they will find it bizarre that we see it as something remote, not what we really do, maybe in a separate section, maybe in our section, but we don't really know anything about them at all. Uh, so I think that is a big change that is going to have to happen, um, that we are able to talk with our colleagues in these other languages such as Mandarin, and we need to do it because if we don't, they will just talk to the um, Anglicist specialists because that's their first foreign language. And again, we'll miss out on this whole international discussion of what it is to be studying languages and cultures or however we define it. Um, a last couple of points which um, Charles, Charles number one, has already said, I think. The importance of being outward facing and confident and saying, not being apologetic 
uh, not making apologetics for our subject, but standing proud and saying what we do as a discipline in the, in the way that geographers don't normally begin with an apology. Yeah? So I think we should be doing more of that uh, so that we can hop off the back uh, foot. And we need to do that by engaging with the public in the way that the first generation of modern language specialists at universities, um, people like Carl Coy um, at Cambridge for German, did as a matter of course. They, of course, they engaged with the public and with school teachers and people that we might fear, um, or we might have thought a few years ago, were not really the right type of thing we should be pointing our research at. Um, my final point, which also I think came up, Charles, and what you were saying about the types of publications you're going to have. Uh, I think to define what one language research is going to be, we have to really look at what undergraduate uh, students are getting. Um, and one of our problems as a discipline, if we are a discipline, is uh, the fact that students come out thinking, I can speak German and French, that's really good. They don't come out thinking, and I am a researcher in one language's discipline because I have done a, pro a research project. Some of our students do a substantial research project, but not all of them do as a matter of course. And in nearly every other subject in my university, there is a huge project, a substantial project in the final year that is research. It's a tiny bit of research and it may not be actually original, it may be replicating, but it is research and students come out with a sense that they are in a field and they have made a contribution to it. And I think we could do a much better job of making sure that that's embedded. And that sounded like that was kind of what your publication series was going to aim to do to some extent. Um, and it says stop, which is like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 